If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. I think it's where we'll begin tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I want to, we'll review just a little bit, but we, uh, at the top of each page or at the top of each section, it is connecting the dots. And you remember when you were little, I don't know if they still do it today, I guess they exist, why would they not, but you'd have a whole book of connect the dots and um, you would see a page with, you know, 85 dots on it, all with a number, and you'd start with number one, and you would draw these lines and whatever. And I'd always mess up and skip a number, and it, I would never know what it was. But if you did it right, you would take what looks like a bunch of dots, a bunch of little things that were there right in front of your face, and you'd connect all those dots, and suddenly it would be a car or a dinosaur or something like that. And that's really what we're trying to do. We have all different levels of biblical knowledge in this room, I'm sure, and a lot, we know a lot of nuggets, uh, all of us know a lot of nuggets from the Old Testament, uh, a lot of dots, but connecting those dots should enable us to see something much greater than just little stories here and there. And so that's what we're trying to do, and, and I, I say the trying part in that way because that's what I'm trying to do, and hopefully... Uh, I'm doing a decent job at that. To review, how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. And what's the number sequence that we talk about every time? You can whisper it. That's okay. 512, 5512. I'm just kidding. Uh, and we started with the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then the 12 books uh, after that are what? The 12 books of history. And then... The five books of poetry and the five books of major prophets and the 12 books of... Okay. Genesis begins at creation and where does it end? Where are we at the end of that book? Uh, Genesis, no, that's, you're talking about the Pentateuch. You have, you have taken a survey instead of... I'm trying to drill down. Just kidding. <laughs> Genesis begins at creation and ends at... Where are we at the end of the book of Genesis? Egypt. And then Exodus begins there in Egypt. They've been there for a few hundred years, and they're about to leave. Uh, by the end of the Pentateuch, we are at where, Steve? Ready to cross into the promised land. And then uh, Joshua is the period of conquest. That book covers about 25 years. Joshua leads the people into the promised land. Uh, what's the name of the place where the waters uh, gathered up as they crossed the Jordan River? What is it? Adam, yeah, or Adam, whatever. Uh, that's fine. So they, they crossed. That's not where they crossed, but that's where the water's heaped up, which we don't usually talk about that, but it's not that the Jordan River just parted. It's that the water's heaped up over here, and then they kind of stopped flowing because there weren't any water and became this big wall of water, it seems, at Adam. And then they cross into the Promised Land. The first city that they come to that they... That they battle in the promised land is what city? Jericho. Jericho. And we've talked about that. And then they spend seven years in conquest. Those uh, 25 years that are recorded in the book of Joshua end. And we enter into the next period, which is the period of what? The judges. And we all know about the judges. We've heard it. Uh, there's a book called Judges. Uh, but it's this time, uh, hundreds of years in the history of Israel where they are ruled and led by judges, whatever that means. And we know what it means pretty much, but I'm just saying it's a little ambiguous. But it's maybe not the same way we use the term today uh, all the time. So these judges rule the people. We looked at some of those very quickly. Um, and we're at the end of those judges in the book of 1 Samuel. And we finished that period of the judges and we entered into the next period, which is the period of the kings. Okay? And so we've got uh, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, even the end of, uh, of First and Second Samuel. You're talking about kings in the time of Israel. And so uh, there's the period of the beginnings, maybe the Pentateuch. There's the period of conquest when they enter in the Promised Land. There's the period of the judges when they're ruled by these judges. And there's the period of the kings. And again, hundreds of years we're talking about, thousands of years in the beginnings when you talk about creation and all those generations before they got to to Egypt, hundreds of years in Egypt, uh, 40 years wandering the wilderness, seven years 
uh, battling 31 different kings in the promised land. Hundreds of years, I think it's 350 or so of the judges and hundreds of years of the kings. Thousands and thousands of years is what we're covering. And we'll talk about this again, but keep that scale in mind because we're going to throw out a bunch of numbers. But the, really what you should, what I like to think of is the United States of America has 244 years of history. And we are a very young country in comparison to like everywhere else, almost. But we still know 244, that's a lot of history. There's a lot of things that have happened um, in that time. But everything we're talking about here is longer than that, far longer. And so we see these little snapshots, but recognize generations and generations and generations of people have lived through these things. And they're living in that, that micro moment. Uh, they're not seeing the same big picture that we get to see even tonight. Any comments, thoughts, anything we left off or didn't cover well or any thoughts or ideas before we kind of dive into our text tonight? Okay, I would expect nothing more from you all than silence. Just kidding. I'm just joking. All right, so in, in, at the, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 15 is where we are. And what we've seen is Samuel is the last of the judges. And Samuel gets old. His sons aren't really good guys. The people say, we don't want to be led by your sons. Uh, they're not good guys. And so we want a king. And they demand a king of Samuel. They said, and they say, appoint for us a king uh, so we can be like everybody else, all the nations around us. They weren't supposed to imitate the nations around them. And he can lead us into battle. Samuel said, look, you don't want a king. Uh, you're rejecting God. He's going to take your young men into battle. Uh, he's going to take your young uh, women as slaves or to work for him. He's going to tax you. Uh, he's going to take you to war, all these things. And they said, we want a king. We don't care. And that conversation happens two or three times in the Old Testament and continually they demand a king. And so finally, God tells, early on, God tells Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And to try to comfort Samuel, he's obviously very upset about this. Uh, he's led the people very faithfully throughout his life. And now they have rejected God's system. They've decided to look like everybody else. The first king of Israel, or the Israelites, was who? Saul. And Saul started off as a good guy. And we talked a little bit about that last week. We see his humility. He's hiding in the luggage. They can't even find him. He's kind of a timid guy. Um, but he's the king that was chosen. He was chosen by God. He kind of met all of the criteria of the Israelites. They said, we want a king to be like everybody else. And so they get this tall, beautiful man, Saul, to lead them. And it's exactly what they want when they see him. This is the king they want. Saul turned into a bad guy. And we started to see that uh, last week. Uh, if you're in 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he, must, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Uh, Saul is now here to be the king and Samuel gives him this charge. Here's what's going to happen. God wants to destroy Amalek and the Amalekites wouldn't allow the Israelites to pass through their land for no good reason. They just wouldn't allow the Israelites to pass through their land. And now God's going to go and, and uh, punish them for this. But that's not the point of why we're looking at it. Skip down to verse 7. And if you're in the outline, this is Langfield 25, if you're on page 25. Not the handout from today, but what we had last week. Uh, 15, beginning in verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hivilah, and, or as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he captured... Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, that wasn't the command. The command was to utterly destroy everything. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag, 
and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. And so they went in there to battle, and they destroyed all the stuff that was like garbage, like, go take that to goodwill, take that, we don't care about that. Um, but all the good stuff, let's keep that. Those are the spoils. Uh, and they, they act like they're doing what God said because they destroyed some stuff, but not everything. Verse 10, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he has set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded to go down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them up from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. So they go into battle and they spare the best. Uh, Samuel hears about it. He's distressed. He hears about it from God. He goes to meet with Samuel and Samuel says, hey, or Saul says, hey, Samuel, I hope all is well with you. And then he explains, look, we have uh, done exactly what God said. We've destroyed everything utterly. And he said, well, why do I hear sheep and why do I hear oxen then? Oh, well, those are the best. The, they brought those up to sacrifice to your Lord. But everything else we utterly destroyed. Skip down to verse 20. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, and I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Uh, but the people, the people, the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the kings, of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God of Gilgal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And so Samuel calls Saul out on what he's done. He says, Look, we did everything we were supposed to do. We did this so we could sacrifice. And and those verses that Saul Sorry, that Samuel says there that obedience is uh, to obey is better than sacrifice often gets taken out of context. But when you read it here, it's very clear. He's saying God doesn't want you to come up with your own thing. God wants you to obey him. You don't get to decide to offer God a sacrifice while you disobey him. That's not going to make God happy. That's as bad as all of these things that he lists there. And so we see the downfall of King Saul, the first king. Uh, shortly thereafter, in chapter 16, a young man named David is anointed king. In chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, David kills Goliath. And really, from then on out, Saul is after David. Uh, he wants to kill David. And so there's this constant cat and mouse uh, between Saul, who is the anointed king of God, and David, who is the anointed to become king of God's people. Um, in chapter 25, Samuel, the, the last of the judges and prophet, dies. And then in chapter 31, Saul and his sons are killed. There's a whole lot more detail in the book of 1 Samuel, but we're not going to stop on it tonight. Any thoughts or questions or comments before we continue into 2 Samuel? Okay, 2 Samuel. We're going to have comments here in a minute because it's about to get exciting. But I've got to get through this 2 Samuel. So we don't know who wrote the book of 2 Samuel. And again, uh, we're, we're rolling through the, the period of the kings right now. Uh, the key verse in the book would be first, or 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever, or shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And the book of 2 Samuel is really a, a lot of a book about David, uh, the king, the man after God's own heart. In, in the very first chapter of the book, David mourns the death of King Saul. Uh, Saul had tried to kill him for years. 
And David would not kill Saul even when he had opportunity because he was the Lord's anointed. David had too much respect for God's word. And you see the difference between Saul who says, look, we offered these sacrifices and then we destroyed everything else. And David, whose life is on the line for decades, I think, and who refuses to harm Saul. Uh, In chapter 2, David's anointed as king over Judah. And Judah would be his tribe and his family, uh, more than his family, his tribe. Uh, In chapter 5, David is anointed as king over Israel, all of the nation. That takes place in about 1010 B.C. And so if you look at a timeline and you're trying to measure where that is, that's about 1010 B.C., about 1,000 years before Christ. Uh, David was 30 years old when he became king, and he ruled over that nation for 40 years. Uh, We mentioned it, but there were three anointings. He was anointed before his family first, really just this intimate gathering. And then he was anointed before his tribe, the tribe of Judah. And then he was anointed over the entire nation. In chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant is moved to Jerusalem. Uh, In chapter 7, the Bible tells us that David has rest uh, from all of the enemies, and he wants to build, an, uh, build a temple to house the ark. And if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, beginning in verse 1 there, this is, these are, this, this is the part of the survey that we slow down on, uh, because there's a lot of transitional moments that I want us to, to digest a little bit. And so we'll read several verses here, but in verse 1 of chapter 7, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, that's David, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I have see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, uh, do all that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. But in the same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt. Even to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Uh, Verse 8, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, uh, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may live in their own place, and not be disturbed again, uh, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly." Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over the people, my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, the Lord declares uh, to you that the Lord will make a house for you. David says, how is it that I'm a king of God's people and I live in this beautiful cedar house? And yet the Ark of the Covenant where God dwells is over in a temporary structure in a tent somewhere, in tent curtains. And that's a very sincere, that's a good attitude on David's part. I, I think if, if I came up with that idea, I'd be pretty proud of that too. I think, you know, that's, I'm doing the right thing here, right? So he says to Nathan the prophet, hey, I want to build a house for the ark. And Nathan says, go for it. God loves you. Uh, he's with you all the way. There's no consulting of God. Nathan just goes out and says, do it. So God speaks to Nathan and says, here's what you want. You go to David and you tell him. Look, I don't need you to build me a house. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the pasture. I took down all your enemies. And never once have I said to someone, build me a house. I'm not asking you to build me a house. And it's really not David's place to decide uh, where God should dwell or or that sort of thing. And so uh, he gets shot down a little bit there. Um, In chapter 11, we see David and Bathsheba. And we're pretty familiar with that. Uh, those events. Um, in chapter 12, Nathan, the same prophet, rebukes David, stands before him for the sin that he committed with Bathsheba, uh, for the sin that he committed concerning Uriah and the murder of Uriah and the lie that he told. He calls him out on that. Uh, we've talked about that some just recently, but in chapter 12, 
In verse 9, uh, the words, Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife, and you have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. In verse 13 of that chapter, Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die, however, because... By this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. And so we see the consequence uh, that David realizes from his sin. In chapter 12, Solomon is born to David and Bathsheba. Solomon would be the next king and that son with the two of them. Um, in chapter 15, David's son Absalom conspires against David and when Nathan prophesied, hey, you've sinned against God, and David said, you're right, I've sinned. He said, okay, you're not guilty of the sin anymore, but there is a consequence. One of the consequences was that his family would be torn apart. There would always be strife in his house, and we see that among his children. And there's a whole lot of detail there, too. It's very soap opery, uh, if you guys remember soap operas. Um, I think some of you still like soap operas, but I don't know. Terry's retired recently. She's probably getting back into them. No? Okay. Uh, back in the day, you remember. So there's a lot of that here uh, concerning the house of David. Absalom conspires against King David. There's turmoil in the kingdom, chapter 16 through 24. And that's really the end for our survey of 2 Samuel. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Now we come to 1st and 2nd Kings, and all these transitions are important, but this will be very brief here um, before we kind of jump into something else. But 1st and 2nd Kings, uh, I have a quote. It includes the records and the careers of the kings of Judah and Israel from the time of Solomon to the downfall of the Jewish monarchy before the armies of Nebuchadnezzar in 587 B.C. The kings, the chronicles, those books overlap a lot. If you just read through the book of First Chronicles, your head would spin, my head would spin, maybe you'd be great at it. But you're, you jump all over the place and there's constant overlap between these books as we see the kings, the, the various kings. And again, hundreds of years of history. And you see kings from two different kingdoms and you see kings from outside of Israel and it gets very confusing. You really have to stop and try to chart this thing out, or at least I do. Um, but First and Second Kings starts with Solomon, son of David, to be king, and goes all the way until the exile. And we'll explain that a little more here in just a moment. The outline of these two books, we see the reign of Solomon. We see the early kings of the divided monarchy or the divided kingdom. We see this period of alliance between Judah and Israel. Those are the divided kingdoms. And we see the decline and the fall of Israel and then the Jewish monarchy after the fall of Samaria. And that all might sound like jibber jabber if you don't have a good handle on this, and that's fine. We'll talk about that a little more. Before we get into 1 Kings, I want us to kind of zoom out just for a minute. Because from here on out, there are three major mile markers to the end of the Old Testament. Three big things that happen that... Divide everything up. Uh, the first of those is the divided kingdom. We have 12 tribes of Israel living in the promised land. The land has been allocated to each family. But we will see, as Solomon's son takes over, the division of the kingdom. And that's one of the things I think we probably, growing up personally, I didn't have a good handle on. Uh, I'd hear people talk about the divided kingdom, the united kingdom, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Israel, Judah, and it all, I don't know which one's which or what it all means. I do now, but I didn't. Um, mile marker number one is the divided kingdom, and we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail. Mile marker number two is the exile. Uh, I always heard there was the exile. Oh, that was before the exile, after the exile. That was Babylonian captivity. All that stuff just ran around in my head. I never had a good handle on it. I do now, I hope. And mile, mile marker number three is the restoration. And so from here to the end of the Old Testament, of all the books, prophets, everything, we see the divided kingdom, uh, we see the exile, and we see the restoration where they come back uh, to the promised land. If you can keep 
in your mind, if this is confusing at all, if you can keep those three ideas in your mind, everything else we talk about will kind of rotate around one of those ideas. And my thought is we'll go through 1 Kings here. It's very quick what we've got. There's some reading. I probably shouldn't have given you that handout. And then the next, the handout that I gave you is just that. It is a, it is a little bit of a deeper dive into those three events. So we can get a handle on those three events. And then we'll zoom out again. And we can look at each of the prophets that fall into those categories. Because that's really, for me, the only way we could look at the prophets and get some value out of as a survey. Any thoughts? I want to give opportunity if there's questions or comments. Did I miss something? Something super important to you that... You talk about more controversial stuff? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let's look into 1 Kings uh, here. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings. Um, it's very brief what we'll look at. But in 1 Kings, Solomon, the, the son of David, becomes... Sorry. Yeah, Solomon, the son of David, David and Bathsheba, becomes the king. And what is it we remember most about Solomon? A couple of things, probably. Wisdom, right? He prayed for wisdom. What a wonderful thing to pray for. He didn't pray for wealth or riches, uh, but he prayed for wisdom. And because he prayed for wisdom, he got wealth and riches. He got kind of everything uh, because of that. Um, that's what I always remembered as a kid, and that's what we remember he becomes king about 970 B.C., and just keep that in mind. David dies in chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 of 1 Kings. I want to read the first few verses here. Uh, As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. God has promised this kingdom to David and his his lineage, if they will only be faithful to God. And as David dies, he pulls Solomon in and he says, do everything the law of Moses says. Follow every commandment of God. Do, be careful to do everything. He charges him with that uh, before he dies in chapter 2. In chapter 3, we won't read through it. Solomon prays to God for wisdom, and God is grateful for that prayer. Uh, how often do we pray for wisdom? Very often. I pray for wisdom more than I used to. I used to think, it's right here in the Bible, what a great example, and I didn't pray for wisdom very often. Uh, but sometimes wisdom comes with bad experiences, right? You have to, you gain wisdom through trials. Sometimes it's kind of scary to pray for wisdom. But uh, anyway, Solomon prays for wisdom. Uh, in chapter 4, we see the result of his prayer for wisdom, and you can look at that if you choose to. Chapters 5 through 7, Solomon builds this wonderful temple for the Lord. Uh, God had said that David could not build the temple. Now, what was the primary reason that we recall why David couldn't build the temple? Yeah, I think we all said the same thing. He had too much blood on his hands. He, he was a man of war. Uh, God didn't want that to build his temple, and so he chose Solomon to do it. Um, in chapter 8, there's the dedication of the temple. In chapter 9 through 10, the Queen of Sheba comes to Jerusalem to test Solomon's wisdom. She's heard about it. The whole world knows about it. And she asks him question, questions. Uh, Solomon sins and turns away from God in chapter 11. And if you have your Bibles and you're keeping up with me, if you'll turn to chapter 11, I do want to read those verses. Uh, beginning in verse 4. Uh, remember the charge he was given by his father. Here in chapter 11, verse 4, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away, from, uh, away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after the Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountains of uh, which is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did 
for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And that references uh, once when Solomon was in prayer and once when he was in the temple, God appeared to him and spoke to him. Uh, And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. And so the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your day for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear it away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So Solomon turns into a bad guy. He falls away in a big way. Uh, He has all kinds of wives, hundreds and hundreds of wives, and he starts to worship their idols, their foreign gods. Israel has a real problem with idol worship. And he gets really caught up into it. He's the guy that built the temple, and you can imagine how uh, amazing it must have been to see the temple and to know that's where the Ark of the Covenant is, that's where God comes and the Day of Atonement and all that stuff. And then you go out and build temples to all these other gods up on the high places, which boggles our minds. But he does that, and God's angry because he's turned away from him. He has fallen away, and he says, I'm taking the kingdom away. He didn't follow the charge given to him by his father or by God, and so God's going to take the kingdom away. That's the division of the kingdom. That's when the divided kingdom takes place. The reason the kingdom was divided was because of Solomon's sin, because of his idol worship, his great sin against God. Solomon dies in chapter 11. In chapter 12, 931 B.C., uh, the kingdom is divided. And if you're keeping up in chapter 12, beginning in verse 13, and we'll come back to some of this when we dive a little deeper, um, the king ends, well, I don't want to read that passage um, because that will just get us confused. Sorry. Solomon's son was a man named Rehoboam. And we remember Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Uh, Jeroboam was the servant of Solomon that that God told Solomon, hey, I'm going to give it to your servant. But not all of it. I'm going to give your servant. uh, I'm going to leave one tribe for you. And so what happens is there's these two men, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. He takes over and only has uh, Judah and Benjamin, these two little tribes of land, and Jeroboam gets the rest, and now we have the divided kingdom of Israel. And we'll dive deeper into that next week when we get into our handout. But we'll keep going for now. Um, Let's see. In chapter 12, you see Jeroboam's idolatry. He's the northern kingdom, the other kingdom, not Solomon's son. Uh, He commits idolatry. And then I added this chart, which is the reigns of the kings. And I have another chart later that's very similar. And we'll end looking at these two things tonight. But for hundreds of years, you see these kings over Israel and kings over Judah. And we'll say this tonight. When the kingdom divides, we have the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel, and you have the southern kingdom, two tribes of Judah. And so sometimes we call it the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Sometimes we call it Israel and Judah. Sometimes ten tribes and two tribes. The northern kingdom kings are always bad. They're always bad. They never were good. The southern kingdom kings are sometimes good, but they're pretty much usually bad. Even when they're good, they're kind of almost usually bad. (laughs) And so the kingdom is in a mess. And again, for hundreds of years, far longer than this country's been here. Um, As it begins, Rehoboam's in Jerusalem. And you can see that on the left side of that chart. And Jeroboam is the rest. If you think about the kingdom dividing, here's what happens. Jerusalem is only in one place, and it's in the tribe of Benjamin's territory, which is part of the southern kingdom. They don't have a Jerusalem in the northern kingdom. And so very early on, Jeroboam, who is the king of the northern kingdom, says, I can't have people going to Jerusalem for feasts and stuff and going to the temple to offer sacrifices. They're going to go down there, and they're going to decide they want to follow Rehoboam. And so I'll just build places for them to worship up here. And in fact, I'll build temples and I'll appoint priests myself and I'll come up with my own feasts for them to follow and my own sacrifices. And so he created his own religion in the northern kingdom. 
And so, from the very early on, uh, the northern kingdom's in bad shape. On the next page, on 28, we'll just go through this and we'll be done for tonight, but the major events there, for 200 years, the northern kingdom is led by wicked kings. Um, Eventually, the northern kingdom, or the kingdom of Israel, or the ten tribes up north, are taken into exile by the Assyrians. Um, In 622, the book of the law is rediscovered during the reign of Josiah. They found the Bible, basically, their scrolls in the temple. They had lost them. Uh, In 586, Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. In 605 to 535, uh, there's this full 70 years of captivity. That's the exile. And then the restoration begins there, 536. And we'll dive into those three next week. Below that, I have all the prophets. And here's where we'll, after we get through these three next week, we'll start on the prophets. But there are the pre-exilic prophets, the prophets that prophesied prior to exile. So during the time of the divided kingdom, there are the exilic prophets, prophets who prophesied during the exile when they'd been removed from their land. And there are the post-exilic prophets, Prophets that prophesied once they came back. And so, I know that might be too much, but keep those events in mind. Those are the three mile markers. There's the division, which we just saw a hint of, and we'll next week dive into that. Then there is the exile, and then there is the restoration. And everything else revolves around one of those three things. That's where we'll get our bearings as we continue. Any thoughts? Corrections, jabs, comments. Brandon, you got nothing. Joanna, yes, ma'am. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I'd have to, I know there's some 40s in there. I think you're right. I imagine you are right. I will default to you. Yeah, I believe that's true. Yeah, that's true. Well, he wasn't doing much reigning, but he was still there. He was still alive, yeah. I think it was all 40 years, each three of them. And who was Jeroboam? Jeroboam was a servant of Solomon. That's how he's described. And God said, hey, I'm going to take it away and give it to your servant. And then we'll talk about it next week when we talk about the division, how it happened. We'll we'll get more detail and slow down. Um, But when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam said, hey, I'm in charge now. I'm going to raise your taxes. And everybody said, We're not up for that. So Jeroboam said, come with me. And they all went to follow Jeroboam. So he became the first king. And Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom. And God said to Jeroboam, if you do everything I say, you'll be great. I'll take care of you. Your sons will be the king. Everything will be great. The same promise he makes to everybody. Just follow me and I'll take care of you. You won't have any enemies. And immediately he goes the other direction. So, all right. Yes. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. I will probably mix those up at some point, which will make it very difficult. I gave you this handout. Look through it if you want. Uh, You'll have a much better handle on these three events if you just grasp these. Whatever little details I gave you, just five pages of stuff and two pages of pictures. So that's super easy. And uh, that will make next week, I think, more enjoyable for all of us. Anything else before we conclude? Jolene. Right. Otherwise, they wouldn't have found the law. Oh, yeah. Many years later. No. The kingdom is totally broken. And it, I mean, even like we're saying, we'll see when we get into it. But even the good kings are very rarely good. And it's like he was good for a time and then he followed the way of his father or whatever. And just, it's so much bad. It's a terrible time uh, for God's people. And. The result of it is the exile, and that's what we'll see, too. There's so much detail uh, for these next hundreds of years. Deborah, did you have something? You're just kidding. Anybody else? All right. Um, We'll start right here next time uh, as we dive into those three mile markers. Think about those three during the week. Try to remember those three. That will help us as we continue.